The whole reason the world is decaying, the whole reason we all die, the whole reason everything's dying is because it separated itself from Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. I pray as always that this message is a message you've got to have for your people. I pray, Father, that no unwise word would come out of my mouth that would bring shame to your name or harm to the hearers, but only that which is fitting to build people up in you. Amen. Amen. What we've been doing throughout this season of Lent is going through this little booklet. It's the devotional booklet. I hope you've been reading through it. I think it's a very nice and good devotional. And we've been doing that on Sundays and Wednesdays. And in order to continue that practice, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 52. Open up your Bibles to Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Say amen if you're there. Hallelujah if you need more time. All right, Psalm 52. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, devour O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction? But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you've done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. Let's stop right there. So in writing this message, there are certain messages that come easier than others. This was uh, kind of difficult, not because the subject matter necessarily was difficult, but because getting this kind of fine point across might be difficult. So try and stick with me. I'm going to ask a question to begin this, and it might be a little bit complicated of a question, or at least long, but we're getting to a point, you just got to trust me. Have you ever said something to another person that while technically you reported the truth to them, when you said it, you knew it was not going to cause anything good in the life of the hearer? Meaning like this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this to this person. It's true, but it's not a fact that they actually what? Need to know. But it's true. And I'm going to tell it to them. And my motive is I kind of want them to be upset by this little factoid that I tell them. And I'm whitewashing what I'm doing because technically I'm telling the truth. You guys follow? Has that ever happened before? Yeah. Most of the time when we think about gossip, we think about gossip as a lie. Even with poor, poor old Angus, Sophie only got that sheep cut because of the spring. But a lot of times we gossip and we excuse it because what we're saying is technically the truth. Why am I bringing all this up? Well, in Psalm 52, there's a prelude. I didn't read the prelude. But if you look in your Bibles, there's a prelude to this psalm. David wrote this psalm, and this is what he says. To the choir master, a masculine of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Well, that, that sound, sounds like I'm speaking in tongues, right? All right, so to the choir master. Psalms were originally sent, uh, written to be sung. At our 830 service, for example, we've begun this practice of singing the introit, the entrance. It's a psalm. The psalms were meant to be sung. Okay, so he says, what, this next psalm that I've written to the choir master, a maskil, usually means like something that's prudent, a word of wisdom, 
uh, there is controversy over exactly what masculine means. So, all right, this word of wisdom from David. And then he tells an event. When Doeg, the Edomite, came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Well, this means nothing unless you know that story. So in 1 Samuel chapter 21, 22, don't turn there, we don't have time, but I'm going to tell you the story of Doeg the Edomite who came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. So Mike Ellis, where are you? He is going to be Ahimelech. Come on up, everybody give Mike a hand. He's going to be our Ahimelech. <laughs> Graham, come on up. You're going to be Saul. Everybody give him a grand. Graham is going to be Saul. Matt Warner, come on up. He's going to be King David. Look at young Matt, King David. And I forgot to get a Doeg. So since this entire family is here, Joe Gronow, come on up. You're going to be Doeg. Come on up, Joe. Joe Gronow is going to be Doeg. Ah. And actually, since his grandson is being baptized today, I want the whole family for the rest of the day to call him Doeg. Can, we, can, we, can this be? He's going to be Doeg. All right. So we got Doeg. All right. So here's Doeg. This is Doeg. This is, this is Ahimelech, this is Saul, and this is King David. Okay. Now, Doeg, this is what I need from you. Doeg, I need you to stand right here next to Kaya looking at, looking at Ahimelech, all right? So look, there you go. All right. So Ahimelech, in the story, is the high priest. Ahimelech is an honorable dude. He's a good guy. He's the priest of God. He ministers over the tabernacle, and good man, Ahimelech, all right? David was anointed king of Israel by the prophet Samuel. And he was the rightful king of Israel within the context of this story. Honorable man, a man after God's own heart. But King Saul would not abdicate the throne. So even though David worked in the kingdom of Saul, Saul became furiously jealous and furiously angry at David. So David had to escape from Saul because Saul wanted to kill David because Saul knew that David was going to be king and supplant him. Everybody follow the story so far? So David runs away from Saul, and in the midst of running away from Saul, he comes to Doeg. Just move back just a couple spots. Perfect, Doeg. All right. So he runs to uh, Ahimelech because he's running away from Saul, and Ahimelech knows none of this. He's just been doing his priestly stuff. He's honorable Ahimelech. He's a great guy. As far as all he knows, David is one of Saul's chief servants. That's all Ahimelech knows. So David comes and he's tired. And David even says, hey, I'm in service to the king, but we're all famished, me and my party. Is there anything to eat? We need bread. I'm hungry. I need bread. All right. <laughs> he needs bread. Great acting, David. Okay. So Ahimelech then says, hey, we only have the bread of the presence that we put before the Lord, but because you're David, uh, okay, I'll have it. Just make sure you're holy. So give him the bread. Uh, bread. Ah, fantastic. All right. Then he says, I need a sword. I need a sword. Ah, so he gives him Goliath's sword because David slew Goliath and they kept that at the tabernacle. And then David goes. Go, David. All right. Now Doeg is Saul's chief shepherd. He's the, the chief of all the shepherds. And Doeg was there at the temple and saw it all take place. Saw everything that, <laughs> saw everything that happened. So Doeg, because Doeg is concerned about Doeg's position, Doeg's power, Doeg's prominence, he says, aha. I, aha, very good, Doeg. Great acting. Great acting. Doeg says, I can make myself prominent with Saul by going and reporting what took place. So Doeg goes to Saul and says, Ahimelech, help David. Ahimelech, help David. Okay, so stand right there. Stand right. You're right next to Saul now. All right. Saul gets, is furious with rage. All right? So Saul gets all of his servants to get Ahimelech and all the priests with him and calls them to the kingdom. So come on over here, Ahimelech. And Saul, <laughs> Saul says, what is this that you have done? What is this you have done? Good job. All right, so, 
And Ahimelech says, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I thought David was like your right-hand man. What are you talking? I didn't even understand there was drama at all. But Saul is so furious with rage, he says to the soldiers that are around him, you go, I want you to kill Ahimelech, the priest, the high priest, and I want you to kill all the priests. Just kill them all. The, the soldiers then, they, they have some courage, and they're like, uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. But Doeg doesn't have a problem. So all the priests are lined up and they're afraid. So one by one, Doeg slits the throats and kills 85 of the priests single-handedly. And uh, Abiath, Abiathar, Ahimelech's son, does escape, becomes the high priest when David reigns. All right, so that's what happened. Everybody give him a hand. All right, yeah, very good, very good, very good. All right, so that's the story. That's what took place. When David wrote this psalm. Now, it's with that context that we go back to the psalm. You got to know the story to understand the psalm. <clears throat> Why do you boast of evil, almighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You will love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue, but God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. Here's the psalm, and it condemns Doeg for lying. But I don't think you and I would have defined what Doeg did as lying. Because what Doeg did was return to Saul and actually... He, in fine detail, accurately reported everything that had happened. We have to broaden our definition of lying. Sometimes telling the truth can be a lie. And what I mean by that is because under what you're saying is a disgusting, deceitful, horrifying, selfish motive. You're not upholding the truth by telling the situation. Doeg knew what would happen. Doeg only gave Saul this information. Did Doeg know that David was to be anointed king? Yep. Did David know that Saul was in a fit of jealousy and rage? Yep. Did Doeg know that by telling Saul this would cause all this chaos? Yep. Doeg didn't care because who was Doeg thinking of? Himself. He was thinking about himself. He was not thinking of upholding God. He was not thinking of upholding God's people. He was thinking of upholding himself. And he falls back on the rationale, all I did was tell the truth. My point in bringing this home is I think this kind of trash happens all the time. It happens all the time. You got three friends. Just in fairness, I use guys at 8.30, so I'm using girls now, not because I'm saying anything of the... the just, okay? <laughs> so there's... Uh, you know what? I'll play Sally. I'm Sally. Then there's Betty, and then there's Jenny. Betty and Jenny get in a big fight. They get in a big fight. And we're all friends. We're all supposed to be friends. They get in a big fight. I go over to Jenny, and Jenny says, I hate Sally. I'm done with Sally. Sally's the worst. I'm never going to be friends with Sally again. Bye. Okay. Oh, I was Sally. Crud. I meant Betty. That's what she said about Betty. So I go over to Betty. And then I say, Sally said that she's done with you. I mean, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I probably should have just made this guys, all right? <laughs> I'm just not woke enough for this culture. All right, so here we go. Uh, <laughs> Jenny said that she's done with you, and she's not going to be friends with you anymore, and it's terrible, and she hates your guts. Now, what I just said, did Jenny say? Did Jenny mean it? No. You know what I've learned about people? This is what I've learned about people. A great majority of people, they just vomit things. 
They just say a bunch of stuff when they're all emotional. They don't mean any of it. Come back to their senses. Jenny could have just been saying, blah, 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 blah. That's really what Jenny was saying. That's what was going on. And I knew that. I knew that Jenny was just all up in her feelings, and she was hurt, and, you know, she really does love Betty, but they were just mad at each other. But because I like to be the center of attention, and I want to showcase how important and how great of a friend I am, I'm going to go report to Betty everything that Jenny said. So now I've put a wedge between them, and you know what? I meant to put a wedge between them, but the whole time I excused my behavior by saying what? All I did was tell the truth. That's all I did. Okay. Politics is 90% that. I'm not making it up. Office problems is 90% that. Problems in family is 90% that. 90% of the garbage we say could have been left unsaid. Seriously, it could have been left unsaid. It served no purpose and value. One of the reasons we can't shut our mouths is we don't think words are powerful. And part of the reason we don't think words are powerful is because we've been lied to our entire life. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Raise your hand if you've heard that phrase before. The biggest, fattest lie in the entire world. I know what they're trying to say. What they're trying to say is it's just words. It's not like you got beat up. But let's just be honest. Aren't there times where you would have rather somebody slapped you in the face than said what they said? So it's a lie. Stop teaching people lies. Words are some of the most powerful things. And I'm gonna, we're going to explain why words are so powerful. How did God create the world? He spoke it. He could have snapped his fingers, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens, and, and it was darkness and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And God snapped his fingers, and there was light. He could have scratched his head, and there was light. But what does it say? And God said, Let there be light. And what happened? light. God spoke. I'm going to tell you why words are so powerful. The whole reason that you do what you do, that you believe what you believe, is someone spoke it to you and you trusted it. Words create faith. They create belief. James chapter 3 verse 1 is one of the most frightening verses to me because it directly applies to my vocation. Not many of you should become teachers. Well, that is encouraging. <laughs> For you know that we who teach will be judged with, stricter, with greater strictness. Why? Why is that? Why is that? <laughs> and it's within the context of religious matters. So I'm not just talking about a grammar teacher. Not that those aren't important. Those are. But within the context, it has to do with teaching the faith, okay? Why is that so important? Why does he say that? Well, I'll tell you why, okay? You're here to hear from God. Amen? You're not here to hear from Chris. Thank you. You're here to hear from God. But this is what you guys have done. What you guys have done, you all have different parts of the body of Christ. You've all decided amongst yourselves. You didn't even know you were doing it, but you did. You decided amongst yourselves, hey, listen, we're busy doing this. We're plumbers. We're electricians. We're teachers. We're stay-at-home moms. We're homeschooling. We're doing all. Okay, so what we need is we need a guy. And what we're going to do is we're going to pool our money together, and some of that money, we're going to pay a dude so that him and his wife and family are taken care of, and then he's going to spend his time studying the Word of God and doing this whole God-shepherd thing. And then we're going to show up. And then we're going to hear what he has to say, and we're going to believe that what he says is actually what? What God's Word has to say, the truth about what God says. So I'm going to believe what he has to say. I always encourage you, check your Bibles, make sure that what I say is true according to the Word of God. But let's just be honest with ourselves. You're here because you trust that what I'm telling you is God's Word. Okay? That's why you're here. All right, great. So then you believe that. You hear it and you believe it. So faith is created by the words that are spoken. 
Now, what if I'm a lying, shyster, demonic pig, and everything I've said is a lie, but you believed it? What's going to happen to you? You will go to hell based on what you believe. All right. That's why he warns, and he says, make sure. You know, some of the hardest words I've ever had to give. People have left the ministry, very close friends of mine, because they were in trifling business, and it was very hard for me to tell them the truth. It was very, very hard. Put the relationship on the line, and it's verses like this that make me do it. Because I think to myself, if I don't tell the truth, I'm going to come, and I'm going to meet him face to face, and he's going to ask me about this event, that I was too weak or scared or uh, immature to tell the truth. So it's my job to tell people what God has to say, not because I'm better, but because you have pulled together and freed me up so that I can do it. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what's happening. This is how powerful words are. Words create faith. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes through the word of Christ. You did not believe in Jesus because you were walking on the street. <laughs> Bam! Bam! There's a guy by the name of Jesus. He died and rose again. Woohoo! Praise God. That's not how it happened. Somebody, maybe it was mom, maybe it was dad, maybe it was grandma, maybe it was grandpa, maybe it was a Sunday school teacher, maybe it was a preacher. Somebody told you about Jesus. And those words, the Holy Spirit used the, those words to transform your heart, to believe in Christ. And you were born again. And faith was created by the power of God. But faith would never have been created if it weren't for what? Words. Don't ever think that words aren't important. They are shockingly important. And a lot of times when we get in arguments, we go, oh, I didn't mean what I said. Well, it's time to start meaning it. It's time to start meaning it. Because the truth of the matter is, we often do just vomit a bunch of garbage, don't we? Blah, 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 blah. Have you ever been around a person that can't stop vomiting? You're around them. They're just a drain of humanity. There are some people that just speak. They're just talking into the air. You don't even know. Have you ever been around somebody and they're just talking? We don't know why they're talking. Are they addressing me? I have no idea if they're addressing me. Do they want something? I have no idea if they want something. They're just using language. It's just verbs and subjects and objects. They're just talking. I have no idea. Uh, he, the point is, mean what you, what? Say, mean it. Mean what you say, because what you say has an impact on who? Everybody. Has an impact on everybody. Doeg told the truth, but he told the truth to uphold a lie, only to serve self. Does that make sense? Who was Doeg thinking about his entire, that entire time? He's thinking about me. You and me ought to be different. You and me ought to be different. Doeg reported accurately what happened, but he didn't tell the truth. Doeg's lie wasn't about facts. It was about intentionally sowing hatred, discord, and murder in order to elevate the self. I think that's very important. The Bible says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Simpletons, simpletons take this verse and say it's only about cursing. I'm not saying cursing is good. Don't, that's not what I'm saying. But it's a simpleton. I would rather you curse 75 times a day than tear down another human being. The corrupting talk is not swear words here. Don't swear. But that's not what this is. Look what it says. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for what? It's about tearing other people down. Whether it's true or not is inconsequential. Only let what builds up Christ out of your mouth or what builds up another person. Why? Why is that so important? I'll tell you why it's so important. Jesus said this, I am the way, I am truth, and I am life. And this is where the sermon gets to Jesus. 
Bless you. <laughs> what is a way? It's a path or a road. I'm the avenue to the Father. I am truth. When Jesus spoke, all he spoke was truth. He was truth in a person. And I am life. The whole reason the world is decaying, the whole reason we all die, the whole reason everything's dying is because it separated itself from Jesus Christ. He's the source of life because he is life. To separate from Christ is to separate from life, and therefore to separate from life what is caused? Death. So if Jesus is the truth, what you say is either going to point people to him or it's going to point people to yourself. And what our job as Christians is to point everybody, everybody, to Jesus. We are so innately prideful, self-centered, that we really want to be the number one in people's lives. That's why Sally told Betty what Jenny had to say, because Sally wanted to be prominent. When in reality, Sally should have been pointing Jenny and Betty to who? To Jesus. I'd rather not tell Betty what Jenny said because Jenny said it in anger and upset and in a fevered pitch, and there's no need. It's all true, right? But she doesn't need to hear that because I know the truth, and the truth is that God wants Betty and Jenny together and pointed at him. So I'm going to be wise. And I'm not going to tell Betty what Jenny said because it serves what? It serves no purpose. Least of all, the purpose of Christ. See, this is how hard things get. And when you actually think through about it, that's why I love this psalm. That's why I wanted to do this psalm. Because lying is not just about not telling the truth. Lying is about pointing people to yourself instead of Christ as if you were the way, as if you were the truth, as if you were the life, and you aren't, and neither am I. He is. So let us be his people. He is the one that was born of a virgin. He is the one that cast out demons. He is the one that walked on water. He is the one that cleansed lepers. He is the one that withered the fig tree. He is the one that stretched out his hands and feet. He is the one who was crucified. He is the one that bled for you. He is the one that bled for me. He is the one that rose again. He is the one that ascended to heaven. He is the one that is advocating. When Jesus speaks of you, do you know he does not speak of your sin? When Jesus talks of you, all he says to his father is, that one is mine. When Jesus speaks of you, he doesn't highlight the evil or the bad or the gross. He already died for all that. When Jesus speaks of you, he only speaks to his dad about saving you. Isn't he a good God? Let's be his people. Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. We love you, Lord. Forgive us for being self-centered. Forgive us for being selfish. Help us, Father, to point people to you. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen.